I saw more and more shooting. I heard some people crying, maybe people injured, and I don't. I heard this, and then I watched somebody like an angel. I really think it's like an angel. Somebody jumping into the our our room like this. And he looked up something like this, and it was really something an angel. And he uh, came down, took a uh, loudspeaker in his hand, and started to talk in Hebrew and say, "You everybody, don't move and lie on the ground on the floor." June 27, 1976, Air France Flight 139 took off from Tel Aviv, Israel, carrying 246 passengers. It was headed towards Paris, France. The plane stopped in Athens, Greece for a scheduled landing to board more passengers. Four of these passengers did not plan on arriving in Paris. Two were members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. The other two, Wilfred Bose and Brigitte Kuhlmann, were members of a German terrorist cell. Two minutes after takeoff, the hijackers rushed to their feet, carrying small arms and grenades. They quickly stormed the cockpit. Flight 139 had been hijacked. The hijackers caused the plane to land in Benghazi, Libya for refueling. From there, they took off and landed in Entebbe, Uganda at 3.15 p.m. June 28th. They were personally welcomed by Ugandan dictator Idi Amin. Idi Amin was the Ugandan president from 1971 to 1979. After Uganda gained independence from the United Kingdom in 1962, Amin began his rise to power. He became the commander of the army in 1965. In 1971, he launched a military coup against President Milton Obate and declared himself the new president. He was known as His Excellency President for Life. The hostages were taken off the plane and into a nearby building. Over the coming days, the terrorists separated the Jews from the non-Jews. 148 non-Jews were released from captivity. 94 Jewish hostages, along with the 12-member crew of the Air France flight, were left. The hijackers threatened the hostages with death if 40 Palestinian prisoners were not released from Israeli captivity by July 1st. Israel tried to have the hostages released through diplomatic means. They contacted various people who had relationships with Idi Amin, such as Baruch Berka Barlev. However, all attempts were unsuccessful. Israel was prepared to release the prisoners if no diplomatic or military plan looked successful. Shemun Perez, Israel's Minister of Defense, believed that a military plan was a must to dissuade future terrorists. No negotiations with terrorists. You want to invade Uganda, Shimon? We give it back to them when we leave. The Israeli government was unsure of how to proceed. Invading Uganda to get their people back could be seen as an act of war and they would be condemned by the UN. However, Israel knew they could no longer attempt negotiation with the terrorists. They would meet force with force, but they needed time. They asked the terrorists for an extension to the deadline. The terrorists agreed and extended the deadline to July 4th. They began to plan a raid to free the hostages. Their plan consisted of dropping commandos into Lake Victoria and proceed to the airfield from there. The plan fell apart when it was discovered that the lake was full of crocodiles. The Israelis also faced another problem. None of their aircraft could travel the distance necessary on one tank of fuel, and they lacked the ability to refuel in air. They asked multiple African nations if they could land their aircraft for refueling. Many were sympathetic, but they all knew what Idi Amin would do to them if they helped Israel. Bruce McKenzie, Kenya's Minister of Agriculture, persuaded the Kenyan President Jomo Kenyatta to allow the Israelis to land. Mackenzie was killed two years later in a bombing after Amin ordered his assassination as punishment for helping Israel. Mossad, Israel's intelligence agency, interviewed the released hostages to build an accurate database of the airport and where the hostages were kept. After multiple days of planning, four C-130 Hercules transport aircrafts departed, carrying the Israeli task force. The task force was formed of around 100 personnel, which included intelligence and support personnel, including Brigadier General Dan Shamron. A 29-man assault force of deadly commandos led by Yonatan Netanyahu, and then a securing force. The operation was commanded by General Yucatul Adam.
The strike force landed under the cover of night. They drove a black Mercedes followed by an escort of Land Rovers, resembling the motorcade of Idi Amin, hoping to fool the security at the airport. The ruse fell apart because the guards at the airport knew that Amin had recently bought a new white Mercedes, replacing his black one. The guards were quickly dispatched with rifle fire. The Israelis exited their vehicles and breached the building. They shouted, Stay down, stay down. We are Israeli soldiers in English and Hebrew. However, three of the hostages stood up and were shot dead by the Israelis, who believed them to be the hijackers. Hijacker Wilfried Bose entered the room and fired at the Israelis before being quickly gunned down. The hostages then pointed out what room the rest of the hijackers were in, and the Israelis shot down the final three hijackers. Outside, Israeli forces were destroying MiG fighter jets to prevent a Ugandan pursuit. As the Israelis loaded the rescued hostages onto the C-130s, Ugandan soldiers began to fire from a control tower. Five commandos were injured, and unit leader Yonatan Netanyahu was killed. The Israelis quickly returned fire, killing 33 to 45 Ugandan soldiers. The Israelis loaded the planes and left the airport after only landing 53 minutes before. Out of 106 hostages, 102 were brought home. Three hostages had been killed. Dora Block was left in Uganda because she was in Kampala, Uganda at a hospital after choking on a chicken bone. After the Israeli raid, Idi Amin had her executed. All of the terrorists had been killed along with 30 to 45 Ugandan soldiers. The mission had been a success. In the aftermath of the raid, the United Nations condemned Israel saying the raid was a serious violation of the sovereignty of a member state of the United Nations. Meanwhile, Western nations like the United States and the United Kingdom praised Israel in saying the raid was an act of self-defense and a necessity. Israel had been faced with a conflict and they decided that the best compromise was no compromise at all.